Our second module is about epigenetics and neuroplasticity. Let me give you a bit of an introduction to the importance of neuroplasticity. The brain is an amazing organ. It is constantly adapting to the environment around us and can be trained to respond differently. So in other words, few people are incapable of behavior change. Most of us are capable of it, though I will add behavior change can be also very hard. And the reason why it's difficult is because while the brain is plastic and adaptable, the brain rewards routine to conserve resources. Now, why does it do that? Well, to understand that, you have to understand that the working memory we have is limited, that we can only typically remember uh, 10 or less things at the same time in our working memory. So for that reason, the brain tends to put a lot of our behaviors on automatic autopilot. A good example of this would be driving in the car. Most of us have had the experience of getting in the car, closing the door, turning on the ignition, and driving somewhere and not and arriving at our destination and having no memory of driving just our body just seemed to do the work and we will think of something else another example would be i have had times when i've gotten in the shower in the morning and i've gotten out of the shower i've been thinking about something and i'll ask you know did i use conditioner today i wasn't even thinking about it my body was just following its typical trajectory of what it typically does and all of this is to, again, conserve working memory so you can do more higher order thought, thought tasks. Another good example is riding a bike or learning to drive or learning to play a musical instrument. At the very beginning, you spend a lot of cognitive energy and resources on getting it right, on focusing. But after a while, you develop this smooth kind of behavior whereby you're, you know, you're uh, well-trained, you know what's coming next, your body can do it automatically, and you don't even think about it. You're more focused on you know, whatever it is that your mind is, is thinking about that day. So for that reason, it becomes difficult to interrupt automatic processes, such as substance use or cutting behavior or anything else like that, whereby we've done a behavior repetitively, our body and brain get used to it, and will engage in the behavior without much thought. And that just it requires a very intentional focus to change those behaviors. You see this a lot in people who have chronic anger problems, that they get easily angered. It's very difficult for them to be able to step back and think through the situation before responding. So that gives us a bit of a background to some of the topic areas within this module. First, we're going to learn about the biology of marginality and psychoneuroimmunology, it's a long word. So what, what does it, all that mean? Well, it's important for you to understand the impact of repetitive stress and trauma exposure on the brain and body, especially at a young age. We'll look at a longitudinal study about children who've been sexually abused and what happens to them across the lifespan. We'll also look at epigenetic and multi-generational transmission of problematic brain states. And we'll look at the studies of children of Holocaust survivors uh, to understand this better. We'll also look at rat studies, which can provide some information, though are limited, you know, because you can't always translate rat studies into human uh, studies. So that's an introduction to the biology of marginality and the impact of stress and trauma on a person. We'll also look at psychoneuroimmunology, and, or sometimes called PNI. And PNI is about how stress impacts a person's health. And we'll look at chronic inflammation and its role in health conditions. We'll also talk about what you can do as a counselor to help address these issues with stress, how to reduce stress in a client, how to create a safe environment whereby a client uh, feels like they uh, don't need to be constantly on alert and in a high stress state. In our second part of that module, the second module, we'll learn about the neurophysiology of traumatic stress and this will build upon the information we cover in the biology of marginality uh, part of the module. We'll learn about what happens to a person during and following a traumatic event, why the brain responds that way, what survival mechanisms the person has and how they're often adaptive in the moment but become, can become disabling over time. We'll also learn about the aspects of trauma that are neurologically related, such as memory dysregulation and flashbacks being an example of that, the hypostartal response, sleep disturbance, rage episodes, fear and avoidance, and shame. We'll also, to, in the conclusion of that part of the module, 
uh, learn approaches to neuroscience informed trauma work. One example of that being eye movement desensitization and reprocessing, also called EMDR, will learn about what uh, EMDR claims and the neuroscience that it claims to be grounded in. In the third part of the module, we'll learn about the clinical neuroscience of substance use disorders. Here we'll need to dive deeply into epigenetics. We'll learn about gene transcription of proteins, for example, RNA, not just DNA. We'll learn about the neuroscience of learning and, and uh, explore um, Delta Fos B and some other important um, uh, uh, gene transcription methods. We'll also learn about the relationship bet uh, between the predispositions we have toward addiction versus overlearned behavior, answering those bigger picture questions such as can anyone develop an addiction or are specific people predisposed? We'll also look at addiction processes. For example, we'll learn about how addiction develops. Often it's based on positive reinforcement, seeking or wanting a drug for the hedon hedonic properties of it. That's called incentive salience, that something is important to us, so we desire it and seek it. Then we'll learn about what happens over time, which is more of an avoidance of negative effects of withdrawal through negative reinforcement. We'll continue to use the drug in order you know, not to experience those uh, nasty physical symptoms of withdrawal. And then we'll talk towards the close of that uh, or learn about towards the close of that module about the role of medication assisted treatments and why those are so useful in addiction treatment and what the neuroscience of medication assisted treatment is. So that'll conclude our learning about the second module on epigenetics and neuroplasticity. And I think this one will be a little bit more digestible to you with a little less terminology, though there's still quite a lot of, the, of it in there that you'll need to be exploring and again using the glossary to understand.